Lifestyle Magazine. It's so fucking awesome to be here right now in Seattle. We have been traveling a lot, checking out some other bands outside of Portland, and we happen to be sitting with the one and only fucking Coven right now. Yeah! So guys, I'm gonna hand the mic off. And I'd like to t for you guys to tell everybody in Wild Child Magazine who you are, what you do as a band, and how long you've been playing here. Hey, I'm Eric. I'm the bass player that plays bass. <laughs> wow. My name is Jamie. I'm the lead singer. I've been in the band almost a year and a half now. I'm Dean Babbitt, original guitarist. About, uh, I don't know, 25 years. I'm Neil Babbitt. I'm the drummer since the beginning, pretty much. I'm the Under Bishop guitar. Two years. Under ago. Bishop. <laughs> Under Bishop. Yeah. Under Bishop. It's poisonal. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. So I just got you guys down in Portland, Oregon. Uh, it's the first time you guys have played down there for like 20 years. You guys, uh, well, second time. But uh, so you played in the Ash Streets. Why don't you guys tell me individually how it is to play in Portland after 20 years? But two, how it felt to have that following after this long of a uh, hiatus. He doesn't want to talk. Well, I'm not the one to actually speak he about that, so let me tell you why. All right, he doesn't want to talk. Playing the Ash Street was awesome. When we play gigs in Seattle, people are just not that impressed. I don't know what their problem is. Sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. I'm not dissing anyone in Seattle who loves metal and loves us. I want you to come to our shows and have a good time. But when we play the Ash Street, it's like a thrash reunion. The people just love it, and they, they freak their minds. Maybe because we only played there twice, and we played in Seattle more, but... I don't know what it is, but that place is a great energy for us, and we really love playing in downtown Portland. The last time you played uh, in Portland was actually back in the day, was at the Starry Night Club. Right? That's right. And, and so I'm curious, did you guys actually have to pay to play? Were you actually selling tickets for that show in order to play it? Or were you on a tour? No, uh, I don't have, no, we definitely weren't on tour, but I don't ever recall paying to play. I mean, what we did the most when we started out, because there weren't any real clubs that we were playing thrash in, we would rent VFW halls and, you know, just get a couple of bands together. Four Century, we would play with a lot, a band called Saber. Uh, Mace, the Touch accused. The Portland gig. Well, My Remains, which we also played with. My Remains, Portland. I remember that. My Remains, we played with them a lot, but mainly it was VFW halls or something where it was all ages, because definitely people at that time, you know, our fan base was younger. They weren't there weren't that many people over twenty one at that time that were into thrash in the mid eighties. Well, we couldn't uh, afford we, to pay to play. <laughs> yeah, because you guys came from, like, a pizza. Prerequisite. prerequisite. Exactly. You guys were, like, cooking pizza, like, we taking all your it. tips and then, That's like... Right. That's right. We saved up our tips to go in and record. So, yeah, we definitely weren't paying to play. Um, just because we would end up not playing. <laughs> Like, what was that scene like? Because it has to be a lot different than what you guys are doing right now. 
Well, we actually recorded the album about a block away from where we lived because it was the only studio we knew about. I mean, we're that naive that we just thought, hey, there's a studio, let's record there. We didn't check anything out. And like I said, we recorded as we got pizza tip money and as we wrote three songs. Th those were the only songs we had. At the so when it, I mean, how long did it take you to actually create that demo? Well, like I said, we recorded a three song demo because back then, you know, you had a, a two inch tape, it would do about 15 minutes. I you say do this like so on a back tape? <laughs> yeah, yeah we buy a two inch studio tape, it would do, that's all we had the money for, we'd do three songs because that's all that would fit on there. And those were the only three songs we had at the time, basically. We'd write three more and go in and record three more, and a lot of the times, uh, Jay hadn't even really learned the lyrics yet. He would read them off the. I mean, if you if you notice when you listen, I don't know if you should, I should be giving this background here. You should but, give the background but, uh, with like it. If you notice, if you listen to the lyrics Watch on uh, McDonald M. Asker, Jay actually says he's fed up with fast fluid <laughs> because he's reading it and and he's you know <laughs> I'm he, he just can't get it right you know. <laughs> I mean, that's how it is, and and actually, that's kind of how the songs turned out as they did, because Jay's just screaming out the words, and he's got his way of putting them in, because what you used to listen to at the time was Journey and Sticks. So, <laughs> Which is totally uh, different so than, uh, you know, and fucking was the deal. Jay was the only guy we knew that could sing. You know, we had our little group of people, and we said, hey, we're going to play some heavy music. We were into, you know, some Black Sabbath with Dio, and, uh, you know... Uh, now tell tell Jesus everybody Christ. what strip of this was because we're not talking about right now, dude. We're actually talking about the literal back in the day when metal was just fresh well, born. Basically, man. it was basically it's like Death Leopard, Eddie Money, you know. Yeah, I mean that's where we're coming from. <laughs> Transformation. You know, looking at my little notes here, and it's like your transformation from self-production to the, you know the uh, two other labels that came in 1989. It was uh, due. I I'd like to know if this was due to distribution. This is actually due to the idea that you were so out there in your lyrical terms. I mean, was it a matter of when you chose to go from you know ever rapped? to self-production over to Medusa. Was this something that you guys did because it's you had to? It's a matter of lack of management is what it's always been. That's, really? Yeah, I mean, basically we're sold to the Medusa label from, by Everat Records, so. But you returned there later on in life. To, well, to we ended up back yes. there. <laughs> yeah, we ended up back there. What happened is on the third album, we had actually been, you know, we had a hiatus for a couple of years, and uh, Dave Portnow from Everett Records gave me a call and said, hey, do you guys want to do another album? Basically, we hadn't been playing for a while, and I contacted Paul. That's why on that album, actually, we only have, it's just Paul, me, and uh, another drummer, because we hadn't been playing for a long time. Neil was doing something else, and uh, we just decided to put out an album as satanic as we could, you know? I mean, we tried to make the most offensive songs we could possibly think of. <laughs> That's why... Uh, it's kind of a casual... Well, I mean, you return to Everrat, you know, in the third record of 1993 for Boneless Christian, <laughs> and there was some serious band issues then, you know? Like, there was a lot of transition, a lot of production issues. I mean, there was all kinds of stuff. I mean, how did that really affect the release of the album itself? Well, we had just recorded it with our grunge band... <laughs> Grunge band. <laughs> With our grunge band. And the guy that had recorded us, uh, he just basically made us a deal. He said 1500 bucks for a complete album. I guess he was kind of slow at the time or something, so we basically... 1500 bucks. 1500 bucks <laughs> was what we recorded the album on. And he said, whatever, however long it takes. We didn't even have the songs written. It was in the malls, though. I, I remember browsing in 94 and yeah. almost bought it. But I mean, there's a lot of like band transitions. You guys switched a lot of band members, production companies. You literally switched a lot of things in there to make shit happen. I mean, well, yeah, I how did that? Bass. I played bass on yeah. the album. It's mostly just the same. Also, an original member too. It's the same sort of circle of friends, really. 
Yeah, we had a different drummer that had been playing with us. Uh, he was actually another Coven fan that uh, I was, I had a t-shirt shop at the time that I owned and I was printing shirts for his band. And every time he would come in, he'd say, dude, we need to do another Coven. <coughs> so finally, you know, we were offered that deal, so we gave him a call. And we've been jammed with him a little bit in this grunge band. So anyway, went in and recorded it. We were literally writing a lot of those lyrics in the studio, trying to think of, you know, that's why the, the final song we wrote, The Master's Tool, uh, the last lyrics are, um, Jesus fucking Christ sucking cock in hell. And that was the most offensive thing we could think of at the time, and that's kind of where we ended. <laughs> Well, they can look for the same lyrical approach, for sure. <laughs> no. We've got some great ideas. Um, one song is uh, WTF, WJD. What the fuck would Jesus do? And uh, I, I wrote a song called Women of Ridgeway about our, our famous Green River Killer Just up here. Just to let you know, this guy's a cheeky, cheeky bastard. Like, he's so funny. He's got a great I'm not. I don't make anything up or make jokes ever. <laughs> so are you the only one right now writing lyrics? Like, who's no, writing no. lyrics right now? Everyone in the band contributes. We're going to do a song called Romancing the Insane about our obsession with bedding down crazy chicks. And I don't mean crazy chicks like you meet at the bar, I mean crazy chicks like you meet at the mental asylum. You're gonna screw a mental chick oh, on yeah. this album. I like it. The more medicated, the better. <laughs> and, um, it's awesome, dude. What was your question again? <laughs> I got totally distracted by thinking about some, yeah. <laughs> some mental puss. Okay, so uh, what we're trying to say is that the... The fans have come in. Oh, yeah. Come Basically, in. they can look for some old school thrash. Uh, it's obviously not going to be the same. You know, we have a whole, we have a three fifths, a new group. Three fifths, we like that. Three fifths new, two fifths old. <laughs> and, Shake well. One fifth four on down. The floor. <laughs> one fifth down. But um, it's definitely it's old school thrash metal. We're not going to pull any punches with that. We're not trying to sound like Slipknot or Acacia Strain or any stuff like. I like those bands, but that's just not how we play. We play, you know, E two E, E two D. Yeah, we're just yeah, E two D, friggin' thrash, you know. And it's really an honor and a pleasure to be sitting yeah. with you here in Seattle. So, um, from all of us at Wild Child Magazine, from uh, you know Nine Piper Productions, everybody that means anything in the world, man, this is one of the most honorable interviews I've ever done, guys. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing that fucking sound back, and I better be the first one to hear the new fucking CD. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys. Thank so you. Watch out, Maggie. Good night, Cincinnati.